Hello and welcome to the Cycling Podcast. My name is Richard Moore. I'm uh, back from my travels and I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. And Daniel Freib. Hi, Richard. So I've been away for so long that i come back to discover that Philip Gilbert has won a race. Um, that makes it seem like years that I've been away, but it's been a few weeks. And we'll talk about Gilbert in today's episode. We'll also talk about Flesh Wallone, which was this week. We'll talk about the men's and the women's races. We've got interviews with Dan Martin, with Emma Pooley and Lizzie Armitstead. And then in part two, we're going to talk about the film premiere of Slaying the Badger in New York, which I was fortunate enough to attend. And we have an interview with Greg LeMond for that. And then in part three, we're going to cover a few newsy items, such as the Tour de France presentation in Yorkshire, Mark Cavendish, Filippo Pozzato and lots more. The Cycling Podcast. Interviews and analysis. We've got the big talking points covered. Okay, so let's turn our attention to the Ardennes. We'll not mention liege Baston liege because we're going to be overtaken by that. You might be listening to, to this after liege Baston liege so we'll cover that in the next episode. But we've watched uh, the Amstel Gold Race, as I mentioned, won by Philippe Gilbert, and then Flesh Wallone. And you were at Flesh Wallone, Lionel. What can you report back from there? Well, it was a lovely sunny day in, uh, that's actually in the Ardennes, Amstel Gold, of course, not in the Ardennes, that's in the Limburg region. Yeah, of, yeah but they're sort, of, they're sort of, we talk about them as the, the three Ardennes classics, don't we? We do. Erroneously. Erroneously. Perhaps, but you know, they, they're, they, they all have similar characteristics, which, which in cycling are known as Ardennes. They're Ard- <laughs> the Ardennes-style races, aren't they? They are Ardennes-style <laughs> races. Uh, yeah, the Ardennes is obviously the region of Belgium that Liège and, and Huy and Bastogne are all in. Yeah, Flesh Wallonne was... It was a lovely, sunny day. It didn't really... The races were a little bit um, formulaic, as they now are. I think Daniel said to me, either before or just after Flesh Wallonne, that you know once you've seen one... Um, slow motion uphill sprint on the Mur de Huy you've kind of seen them all and it's it's about the nuance of that finish now isn't it just you see riders misjudge it mistime it and one person gets it spot on and in the men's race that was Alejandro Valverde Um, Dan Martin I think thought he was going to be able to catch him on the line but didn't quite have the legs but nevertheless a a good result for him perfectly judged finish by Valverde reminded me of uh, 2008 Tour de France the first stage that he won there on a similar kind of finish, which a lot of people misjudged back then. That was up in Brittany, wasn't it, in yeah. 2008? and he, he won a very, very similar finish also this year at the Ruta del Sol in... Uh, I've no idea how you pronounce that. Hen? Hen. Spain. In, he's <laughs> an, in Andalusia, anyway. Yeah. Um, he's, he's great at that sort of finish. And Valverde is, is... You know, it's kind of back to the future with Valverde and Contador this year, isn't it? We're seeing them... Uh, the sort of Valverde Contador of 2008 to 2009. It's funny how everyone reserves any reserves their outrage for you know after after the finish after is won and you know people talking in the build up to the Ardennes Classics and the Limburg Classic. I'm so cold <laughs> about how disgraceful it would be if Davide Rebelin won, but and they're quite happy to see Valverde win until he actually wins, and then everyone the, the kind of outrage. I haven't been aware of much outrage. Has there been outrage? Well, it, he did get a little bit booed on the podium. There were a, there were a sort of smattering of boos as he uh, got onto the podium, which, um, you know, perhaps not surprising. Um, you know, it's difficult to tell who wh- who they were supporting, these people who were booing, but, you know, nevertheless, there's always that little awkward moment when you realise there's booing, and I looked at Valverde's face, and, and I'm pretty certain that he sort of was slightly taken aback by the sound of... Um, booze from a certain section of the crowd. We should point out for those who are perhaps not familiar, but Valverde, of course, has served a doping ban. He was caught up in Operation Puerto back in 2006. It was a few years until the authorities eventually caught up with him, and he, he did serve a ban. He's been back for a couple of years now, but I think this is the first year we've really seen him truly back to his old form. And and I guess it's inevitable that that some people will be suspicious of that because uh, they will att- attribute his previous best form to the to the the practices he indulged in at the time. Yeah, suspicious and indignant that he's never really opened up about what actually happened and you know he's a rider who in terms of emotional legacy will leave nothing really outside of Spain. I, I get the impression that in Spain he's still quite popular certainly with um, hardened cycling fans anyway, but outside of Spain he he leaves nothing really but kind of antipathy. Um I, it, 
Would you Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think uh, he leaves a lot of other people cold, and it's precisely not so much for doping, but the lack of contrition, the lack of any explanation, yeah. and and the fact that for years, you know, this was hanging over him, and he was carrying on regardless. And I think, um, you know, it was the Italian authorities that really tried to close the net on him for a couple of years, and eventually, Operation Puerta did catch up with him. And you know the fact also that he he served his ban and then returned to the old his his old team. It was it was reinvented as as movie star, and there was a sort of sense that he hadn't really suffered. Um, he carried on training very hard during his ban. There was some ridiculous claim as to how many kilometres he'd ridden while he was banned. But you know when someone's banned for doping, there there should perhaps be a a fear that that they're not going to get another job. Um, that's perhaps how it should work. And with him, there was a sense that you know he was on kind of. It was almost like he was on 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 leave. I'll not say paid leave because I don't know what this, the the arrangement was. But he certainly trained with him on training camps and yeah, stuff, didn't he? When no, he was banned, yeah, there was no, there was no. It, it was the, the ban only really amounted to him not being able to race his bike for a, a little bit. Yeah, and looking ahead at the Tour de France, he's likely to be Movistar's leader there, isn't he? Um, as long as Quintana. Uh, sticks with the plan to ride at the Giro for them. I spoke to Dan Martin, who uh, the Irish rider with Garmin Sharp. Um, he won Liège Bastogne Liège, uh, the, the bigger of the two Ardennes races um, last year. Two Ardennes races. Yep, the two Ardennes races. Although Brabant's appeal would that be the Flesh Brabancon? That would be Ardennes as well. So they're the three Ardennes races and <laughs> one Limburg race, the Amstel Gold race. You see the muddies, the waters have been the muddies have been watered. The, wa- the water has been muddy. muddy waters. Are we, are we going from Lionel <laughs> Richie? The muddy waters, well, yeah. we'll get to that later but things have been complicated rather by the fact that um, Flesh Wallon and Liège Bastogne Liège used to take place on the same weekend back to back so it used to be the Ardennes weekend good knowledge they used to have a dual prize as well for the rider they did a so you know who uh, they added up the top tens of each race and the most consistent rider won a prize from those two races um, and this is a great opportunity to mention Roger de Vlamic because the year that Roger de Vlamic won Liege Bastogne Liege, I think it was 1971. I might be completely wrong about this, but I think Liege took place before Flesh that year, and he won Liege. And then on the day of Flesh well on, he went to watch a football match. I think he went to watch Club Bruges, and there was outrage in Belgium. There'll be outrage at any mention of football. I've been picking up on Twitter some some. Some some negative uh, reaction to m- too many mentions wait, of football. Wait till they hear all your Jamaican sprinting references <laughs> later. <laughs> this is the, the the holy grail. There is a mention of De Vlaming and football in the same anecdote. I think well, we we can't top that. Truly, a, truly, Lionel Richie, a great moment. <laughs> yes, we should move on. Um, I spoke to Dan Martin um, before the race, and then uh, we heard a little bit from him in the press conference after the race. And I think uh, we'll play um, those interviews now. Um, it's just quite interesting, just how keyed up and focused Martin was in the morning of quite uh, short answers wasn't really too keen to engage in a an expansive conversation but it loosened up a bit after getting second place and he explained that um, this was his first big objective of the season as he moves towards um, the Giro. In the past flesh has always been a re- lot easier race tactically as far as it comes down to the new whereas the age is a really much game of poker and team tactics play a lot more because obviously it's a longer race and the fatigue is more in the finals. It's a lot more people looking at each other and, and making the right moves, whereas flesh just comes down to pure horsepower mainly. Yeah. Is it like a kind of almost a sprint finish into the bottom of the moor for the last time in flesh alone, and positioning is absolutely crucial at that point? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, for the for the win, definitely. I mean, it's uh, you have to be right in the front, but it's also a game of tactics on the climb because people say I started too bad last year, but I was actually on Moreno's wheel. I just let them go on the steep part and then came back at them in the flatter part. It's like it's a. Uh, it's it's a it's different ways of riding the last climb, but uh, I think to win there's only like it's you have to learn this climb, and it's very easy to misjudge it and blow up, and you've seen that many times before. And in Liège, best on Liège, you have much more um, of a kind of a slow building race where team tactics come into it a lot more. Last year, um, probably Ryder Hazardal's move was one of the main things that helped set up your win. Was that something that you? Um, talked about before the race was that a predetermined plan or was it something that just played out in the race yeah for sure we knew that the rider's opportunity to win was to go from on that climb and uh, he's not as good at the steeper climbs as me so he uh, yeah he was uh, yeah he, the only way he could win was try to get that and it's the it's the same kind of day today thing today i mean there's a lot of a lot of guys who don't have the the kick to win on the final climb so that's why you're going to see a lot more of a an interesting race tactically with a harder final now i think but uh, but yeah it'd be interesting 
Um, did you see the panda last year? That became quite a big story. You, it, it was behind you, wasn't it? There's a picture of me looking directly into its eyes, but I never actually <laughs> saw it. So. Just lastly, on the Giro d'Italia um, coming up, it's going to be massive, isn't it? Starting in Belfast and Dublin, but those stages are going to be quite nervous, I think, aren't they? Are, are you looking forward to the point where it gets into the mountains? And, and are you? Are, does the weather play a factor for you? Because the last couple of years we've seen terrible weather in the Giro. What? favours you more and what are you looking forward to most? I think the starting line is going to be fantastic it's going to be a big morale boost going into the race in Italy and when I mean, we get a third rest day so that's always good isn't it? Well yeah they say you have to learn how to race with the last line and uh, yeah, every year I seem to get a little bit better again I was uh, a little bit too far back at the bottom but uh, yeah, this year was a different, a different race we went, the race was really, really fast from the, from the bottom of the line and normally we were a little bit of a each other this year we just flat out the whole way up so it was uh, yeah, a bit of a different race, but then um, yeah, I think we said it was the same you know, Alejandro was stronger today and yeah, he uh, was 100 metres to go, I kind of did feel like I had it, but uh, yeah, he, uh, he blew past and uh, yeah. even on Monday my knee was fine, it was more, uh, yeah, it was, it, it was definitely 100% for me today and we, we needed to not be attacked in the final, so we were probably going to be kind of a strong team, the driver and, and, and top stack there and Fabian and yeah, I think the third time split at some point, so I didn't, we didn't get to see Tom uh, Ryder. And it was such a fast race today as well that I think breakaways is good and difficult. But we had Rabunas in the break from the start, and uh, yeah, it's hard to team when you went up to the guy the boys were looking after me in the peloton and kept me in good position all day and, uh, and relaxed. I think that's the most important thing in this race. You have to really save energy by it, just chilling out. This is the Cycling Podcast with Richard Moore, Lionel Burney, and Daniel Freed. So that was Dan Martin. Uh, talking about his second place in Flesh Wallone. Um, there was another, well, I nearly said another British second place in the women's Flesh Wallone. Dan Martin, of course, is 100% bona fide Irish, certainly not born in the, born in the Birmingham region um, with a British father. But uh, uh, Lizzie Armitstead is true Brit, um, and she finished second in the women's Flesh Wallone. That's the four out of four appearances on the podium in the four World Cup races so far. She won the first World Cup, the Ron van der Ronth in Holland, and then has been second in the Alfredo Binder Trophy, the Tour of Flanders, and Flesh Wallone. An incredible start to her season, and I spoke to her afterwards to find out whether the World Cup, now that she's in such a strong position overall, whether that's the main focus of her season. Um, and she said that no, it isn't. I'm very pleased, yeah. It's been a bit of a strange day for me, to be honest, because Flanders was my main goal, and to be honest, my motivation after Flanders has been a little bit different, and uh, I've had lots of stuff going on. I've moved house since Flanders and all sorts, so I wasn't expecting too much from today, and to be able to pull off second is a bit of a nice surprise, really. What was the plan today? Because when you first came over the Muir here, um, you were right in the front of the front group, and it had split behind, and was that how the race then developed on the, the final lap round? It all came together again again after the first mud hoy I just rode it up at my, my own speed the first time and we managed to drop quite a few people so that gave me some confidence and then in the final lap my teammates Megan and Ellen were attacking quite a lot we wanted to try and sort of split the group and I think it was just the race was hard enough the, the, the terrain was hard enough and the final time up the moor I found myself on the front I didn't really want to be there but I found myself there and had to go with it so what happened uh, then it was Pauline did she come from behind you at that point yeah she did yeah Pauline came level with me and we kind of 100 metres to go level 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 and then she just stuck that little uh, dig in and I couldn't follow can you describe what the climb is like because we kind of think of you as a, a bit of a sprinter but these must be a bit like the climbs back in Yorkshire exactly yeah I'm very lucky to have uh, been brought up in Yorkshire I've got some sort of short steep climb pedigree in the legs um, I tried to just think of today as a sprint I know like you said I'm more of a sprinter so I tried to think of murder height as a sprint <laughs> which is the hardest bit is it the Z bend around about the halfway mark just or when it kicks up just after that for me it's the fact that um, it's so fast into the bottom of it so I'm already in the red before I even start the climb and then you have to try and follow people and uh, yeah the whole thing is just painful basically and what about having the World Cup leaders jersey now? Will that become a big goal in the second half of the season to defend that all the way? No, I think I keep disappointing people when I say no, but and I don't want to chase the World Cup and then be able to be tired at the World Championships. I'm going to miss the China round because it's too much travelling. I have an unstable stomach anyway, so I don't want to risk the Chinese food. And then um, Commonwealth Games is the same time as one of the other World Cups, so it's, it's not a goal for me. 
What about the women's tour in Britain? That must be the next big one for you. Yeah, I'm really excited. I think it's going to be a huge race and i um, proud, you know, that Great Britain is hosting an, an inaugural tour. I think it's a that really big step for women's cycling. Have you got your eyes on any particular stage or will it just be a sort of journey into the unknown with those races? A uh, bit of an unknown, to be honest. So it's just my plan is to try and win a stage, so we'll see. You're listening to The Cycling Podcast. Tweet us at cycling underscore podcast. So that's Lizzie Armitstead, and I think after hearing that, perhaps uh, we should all put a few quid on her winning the world title in Spain later this year. Um, the women's race was also notable for the return of Emma Pooley to top World Cup um, level racing. She took a bit of a break last year, um, so she hasn't raced at a World Cup level since the summer of 2012. She's done triathlons, and she's been studying for PhD, and she's back with the Lotto Bellisol team. And she finished seventh in the wheel tracks of Mariana Voss, who uh, was sixth. So I asked her whether she was happy with her comeback. I waited and waited and waited and followed and followed and followed and then tried to attack and that didn't work. And then got a little bit boxed in at the bottom of the muir and then didn't have the legs to close the, you know, close the gap to the leaders and on the steep bit. And uh, so a bit disappointed with position because I had really good help from my teammates and I was pretty calm all race and didn't do anything stupid and stayed in the front and didn't crash, which for me in Fish Valon is already a bit of an achievement. So I'm really proud of the support I had from my team. It was awesome and I'm just a bit disappointed with my own legs, I guess, at the end. It's a very difficult race in that sense because you do have to wait and wait and wait for the right yeah. moment and then you can get boxed in really through no yeah. fault of your own. Yeah, but I had my teammate, she drilled it on the front all the way down the valley, like all the way from like 5k to go. And then I got swamped just on the little draggy uphill bit before it goes into the narrow proper muir and that's annoying. I don't feel great on the climbs, I've been having breathing issues, really tight chested and I have that whenever it gets really hard so I'm, I'm going to get that checked out and hopefully uh, if I get that sorted. I've seen you quoted as saying don't call it a comeback but uh, <laughs> in, terms of, in terms of being back racing in a World Cup race and at this level, how, how does it feel? Yeah, good actually. <laughs> um, it, like the group was was quite small fairly quickly and that was is easier and I don't mind the hard bits of the race it's just the the stress of the bunch of the start that gets me and it was actually it's a really quiet race there's nothing nothing stupid happened and it was pretty good actually because so, it was a big field today 138 starters that's um, quite a quite a bit of a jump up perhaps yeah in that sense I was pleased that I was pretty calm and I didn't I didn't do anything stupid so that was nice <laughs> I felt like I raced smartly I, for me you know I'm well known as being the idiot, but like at least it's just I'm a bit disappointed with you know I felt a bit like didn't quite have the legs at the end. So, and, and briefly, what's next for you? The Women's Tour of Britain is the next race. The Cycling Podcast. Subscribe on iTunes, listen on Audio Boo, and visit us at thecyclingpodcast.com. That was Emma Pooley, a former time trial world champion, a Great Britain rider, back at the top, and uh, we'll be looking to perhaps I think the Grand Prix Plouet would be the biggest objective for her in the second half of the season Um, they'll of course be riding the women's tour early May the stage race taking place in Britain first one something that uh, the the women's calendar will be uh, much the better for I would have thought unfortunately it clashes with the Giro opening weekend in Belfast and Dublin but it will get a lot of coverage I'm sure now Richard you're back from your extended holiday in Jamaica um, you came back via New York and the Tribeca Film Festival where they showed the premiere of Slaying the Badger, the film based on your book, Slaying the Badger. You've seen the film, I'm eagerly looking forward to it, um, but what can you tell us about it? Well, the film is a little bit different to the book. In the book I really strive for uh, balance in terms of uh, telling the story of the 1986 Tour de France where Bernardino was defending champion, Greg LeMond was bidding for his first win, they were teammates they started the race with Eno having pledged to help Le Mans win, and then as the race unfolded, it became apparent that Eno was perhaps not going to honour that pledge. Um, and, you know, I think the way that we, especially maybe in the English-speaking world, looked on that tour was as Le Mans is the good guy, Eno is the, the bad guy. And when I started out writing the book and researching the book, I, I think that's the idea I had in my head. As I spoke to people, as I did research it, as I kind of tried to understand the, the context a little bit more, it, it became a bit more complicated than that. Um, you, you, you know, I started to see maybe slightly more Eno's point of view while still appreciating Le Mans. And I think what it highlighted was this problem, this issue, this challenge in cycling where 
individual athletes, hugely talented individual athletes, are required to shelve their personal ambitions for the greater good of the team. That becomes, as we've seen on numerous occasions, that becomes impossible when there are two riders in the same team who both feel that they can win the Tour de France in particular. So that 86 Tour, more than any, for me, shone a light on the the team dynamics of, of cycling. And in Eno and Le Monde, I think, two really fascinating uh, people and very opposite personalities, which also made it a, a fantastic sporting rivalry. And in the book, I think I tried to, you know, I interviewed Eno Le Monde and, and, and lots of other people um, connected with the, their team, La Vie Claire, and with that race, and tried to present the the facts as I found them or the, the opinions of the protagonists and then allow the reader to make up their own mind. Um, the, the film has been commissioned by ESPN, the American sports broadcaster, as part of their excellent 30 for 30 series, which is... Um, you can find some of these uh, films online. They're, they're pretty much all fantastic. Um, and Slaying the Badger will be broadcast on ESPN during the Tour de France this year. Uh, as I say, it is more from Le Monde's point of view. It's really Le Monde and his wife, Cathy Le Monde, Greg and Cathy, who uh, are a bit of a double act. And they went on that adventure to Europe in the 80s together, and they lived that, that, that period together. And, and so they appear together in a lot of the film. It's beautifully shot very cinematic, the, the archive footage is superb, there's a brilliant clip of Le Monde in 85 at the end of the stage to lose Ardennes when he'd been asked to wait for Eno who was suffering that day um, and Le Monde is having a confrontation afterwards with Paul Coakley, the, the director and saying I want Eno to win but you wouldn't have told him to wait You know, you, you wouldn't have. Told, it's one rule for him, another rule for me and at one point somebody tries to interrupt him, a broadcaster I think and Le Monde, most uncharacteristic turns and says, you want me to punch you in the face? You know, it's a, it's a great little vignette that, that illustrates just how on edge Le Monde was and, and could be you know, whereas Eno was this totally rock steady um, who just, you know, character who relied on brute strength, who was always very certain about what he was doing, Le Monde kind of fluttered between certainty he, and uncertainty. You know, probably wouldn't have asked whether the guy wanted to be punched in the face. He probably <laughs> would have just done yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, they're, they're, as I say, they're, they were such opposite characters, and, and the, that race exposed it, it brilliantly. And, uh, you know, anybody who can watch the film, I would. I'm sure it'll be shown uh, in. Uh, at other events and it'll be available on DVD as well at some point but yeah it's, it's really good and the premiere was a fantastic occasion Lo- um, Greg and Kathy were both there and I think they, they really enjoyed the film and, and you know it's great to see other figures such as Andy Hampston Paul Coakley journalists at Colleagues of ours Sam Abt Francois Tomazo uh, they all feature in the film as well It's directed by John Dower isn't it who made the film about Bradley Wiggins winning the 2012 tour which people may have seen on Sky Atlantic Uh, really great documentary again just getting under the skin of the people that are involved in the story and just gently teasing their characters to the fore without being terribly heavy handed about it I thought in the Sky documentary and some of the the footage and particularly you know Shane Sutton's character comes across very um, dynamically in that. Um, In terms of uh, John's work... uh, Yeah just on that I mean I guess show rather than tell is the is is the uh, the approach and um I would contrast it in that sense with the Armstrong lie the Alex Gibney film which is more tell than show um and I think that's a strength that's the strength for me of the, of this film uh, that you're introduced to these remarkable people and their words and actions are shown to you, uh, explained and, and you, you know, you, you make of it whatever you will. And one per- a reaction that interested me after of somebody who did watch Sling the Badger was, while you are sort of rooting for Le Mans, because it is told from his point of view, you have real, you develop real sympathy for him, he's a very likeable, engaging guy. While you have that sympathy for Le Mans, the, this, this American uh, journalist said, I, I, I couldn't take my eyes off the screen whenever Eno was on. You know, he, he is such a compelling character and, and a sort of villain but a very charismatic and quite likeable villain. I'd say he's still like that today. I stood just um, below the steps on the podium at uh, Flesh Wallone and he was presenting the, the flowers and medals to the riders um, and he still has that magnetism now. I mean he looks as fit as a fiddle. That you, if you had to put an age on him you would, you would say mid-40s almost at, 
um, uh, most uh, and what must he be now? Um, well, he's at least mid fifties. Yeah, he's mid fifties. So, you know, he looks uh, he, he looks fantastic um, now. He's got that. He'll be sixty, and he'll be sixty in two years. Actually, he's fifty because he retired in eighty six on his thirty second birthday. So he'll be sixty in a couple of years, I guess. Yeah. Which makes it all the more incredible. I mean, uh, contrast that, Daniel. We saw the Pantani film uh, recently, and Evgeny Berzin was on the screen, filling the screen. Um, for you wouldn't, have, if you if you had to say he won the uh, the Giro in '94, you wouldn't necessarily believe it, would you? I thought he looked pretty good, Lionel. I mean, um, he's still got a wonderful shock of blonde hair, and um, just looks like he enjoys his food. Does Evgeny? He certainly does. Yeah. <laughs> One way of putting it. What involvement did you have in the film, if any? And do you know if John uh, Dower, the director, um, used the book very much as a kind of uh, reference point or a, a base upon which to tell his story? Because from just watching him work at the 2012 tour, he strikes me as one of those people who is just keeping his eyes out open and his ears open and he's letting the story come to him rather than going off in search of it almost. Yeah, this was a different sort of project for him. The, the film was kind of born at, at the 2012 tour, this thing, the Badger film, because I, he, I, he interviewed me for his, his Wiggins film and we chatted quite a lot and, and I mentioned to him the fact that there was some interest from a, an, another production company in making a film of Sling the Badger and he just read it and said, oh, I'd, I'd like to make that film. So we picked up on that after the tour and it was interesting because that 2012 tour did throw up some of the same issues as 86 when you know, Wiggins and Froome, teammates and the two strongest guys in the race. So in that context, we spoke quite a lot about 86 and about the, 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 the team dimension to cycling. And, you know, so th- that conversation continued after the tour. And, and that's when John took out an option on the book. To, and he did use the book quite a lot. I mean, he interviews the same people. Encouragingly for me, they said a lot of the same things to him. So there was a lot of uh, there were echoes of, of claims that were made in the book, such as Andy Hampston's claim that in 86, at one point, when he attacked to set up Le Monde, on Super Bannier, Paul Coakley drove up to him and said, Andy, you can go and win the tour here. Forget about your bickering teammates. Just go and win the tour. And what was fascinating was Le Mans didn't know that until the book and the the film came out, which was quite quite amusing. And Andy Hampson is another one, actually. He looks about mid-30s. Incredible. He's Benjamin Button of professional cycling. He seems to be looking younger and younger as as the years go on. Uh, So I didn't... I mean, once once John took an option on on the... film I gave him my contacts and we spoke a little bit as he was making it but I didn't have any any involvement in at all and I know they were toying with the idea of, of a different title a title that reflected Le Mans because it is more of his story uh, and it was there were a couple of titles bandied about but obviously I'm very pleased that they went back to the title of the book Sling the Badger which uh, certainly tends to intrigue people if nothing else and, and it's had a lot of publicity thanks to the badger cull in this country I, I've, got a, I've got a Google alert on slaying the badger and I get all these emails about <laughs> real badgers being s- slain which always, always brings a smile to my face but no offence to the badgers yeah um, any badgers listening we don't, we don't, mean, we don't mean any harm by that um, where can people in particularly in Britain see this film is, I gather it's going to be shown in Yorkshire is it just in uh, the run up to the tour is that right uh, no that's not right oh, I'd heard um, it was right no I, I, well actually that no, sorry, it is right. I think there's a chance it's going to be shown at the Sheffield Document- Documentary Festival. I think it'll be shown at festivals. Um, obviously, it'll be shown by ESPN. It, it might be shown in there might be screenings of it in cinemas as well. But it's uh, it's complicated because ESPN own it, and as I say, it will be available on DVD as well. Pirate DVD from down the Holloway Road is. <laughs> Well, uh, you can watch all the 30 for 30s on YouTube. They're all on there. You're not supposed to watch <laughs> no. them on YouTube. I, as I discovered in chatting to somebody from ESPN the other day, that you're not supposed to watch them on YouTube. So as, no, I, as, I, as I reeled off all the ones that I'd watched on YouTube, <laughs> I just saw the face <laughs> falling. But um, no, I, I, it will be available on DVD. Uh, we're, I'm hoping to organise some screenings, and John, I know, is hoping to organise some screenings of it in, in cinemas. So we'll definitely keep you posted or through our Twitter handle, the, the Cycling Podcast Twitter handle. After the, 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 the film, after the screening of the film, I we went for dinner with the Le Mans and, and John Dower, and I, on the way around to the restaurant, I had a chat with Greg about the film, about uh, his involvement back in cycling. He's a Eurosport global ambassador, I think is his title, but he's very much getting back involved in the sport this year, and he talked a little bit about how out of touch he's been, how he doesn't really know this new generation of American riders, how, how keen he is to get to know them. 
and about what his involvement will be at the Tour de France this year for Eurosport as well. So, as I say, we had a chat walking around the restaurant, and here is Greg LeMond. We're in New York. You've just seen the premiere of Slaying the Badger. How did you enjoy that experience? Well, I thought it was a very good film, and I think uh, it portrayed the race, kind of what was going on. Mm. I thought pretty ac- very accurately, pretty accurately. I don't know how you want to say it. How do you feel watching yourself on the screen like that? God, I wish I was fit again. <laughs> no, no. I just looked at how young we were. Sometimes I go, right now, I kind of, I don't take things as, I can get over kind of stuff and move on, and, and I realize, like, that was actually really tense. Sometimes I kind of downplay it and go, okay, well, they weren't really trying to do it. It's just part of hmm. the race. And I realized, no, there was a strategy behind it. And well, how do you I was feel? very gullible. I was very gullible. How do you feel watching Eno? I mean, what are your feelings towards Eno now? I, I actually like Eno, and I think that uh, he actually believes what he did was having fun. But I, I always go back to it was really teppy, and probably Cookley was loyal to Eno. But Tabby was the one saying, screw it, mm. <laughs> go can, for it. Can you detach yourself from this story and, 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 and appreciate that Eno did light up that tour? He did make it a, a really exciting race. Oh, you, God, you were yeah. involved in it, so maybe you didn't... Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, for, for the for, journalists. For, for everybody else. For the journalists, you. except that I wish I could have been able to stay with Guimard mm. in hindsight, but... The, the reality is, you know, I was third in my first tour, and I was disappointed. And I, but the guy, my teammate, who was Finian, who won it, and I'm, I chose Hino's team because we're such an age difference. Thinking that one year, then I'm going to lead the team. And we weren't you, to know what would happen to Finio, who obviously. Yeah. Had I had I been with Guimard, I am. Even you know, I, I'm on the team. I kind of know what's going on. Even this crash, that did not affect his performance. He was fine. It was. I saw him kind of getting just weaker already, you know, even before the stage. Mm. Uh, I love the stories, and I love that everybody's kind of made their own truth. Yeah. What they perceive is accurate. And some of the stuff, uh, I get asked about it all the time, and I, I kind of laugh about it. I said when I saw Hino last year, he, he hasn't changed, and he's the same person. He believes that he helped me. <laughs> So I don't look at it as in, he's not doing it with this e- look, look. mean, evil. It's kind of what he's... It's just what he believes. It's not with yeah. malice. Yeah, And, exactly. and you're, you're back in the sport now, Greg. You're working for Eurosport. You were at Pyru Bay recently. Are you enjoying sort of dipping your toes back into the dipping. waters of pro cycling? Or actually plunging in? Well, I was to dip in, and, and, and it seems like I'm plunging in. <laughs> it's actually, I'm, I'm kind of, I like the format of what we're going to do, and... I do want to, I do love cycling. I think it's, you know, for so many years, there was no place for me because if I went there, it was always questions about Armstrong. Mm-hmm. And no matter which way it looked, it sounded like I was this bitter, jealous guy. And But I, I had to remove myself. And the reality is I, I don't know the racers like I should. I, I need to. But it, it's going to pull me back in, which you're is keen, good. You're keen to get to know them. You'll be at the tour. Yeah, you're going to yeah. be at the, the tour for the whole race, aren't you, this year? So that'll be your first full tour since, since you rode. That's right. Yeah. Since, uh, when was the last one I finished? Maybe. I think, Two? No, 91. 91. <laughs> Since 91. The reality is like these, you know, the sport are, I see my teammates. I was with Juan Antonio Fletcher uh, mm-hmm. last week. God, there's some good people in cycling. And they're all like me. And you know, they're young. They want to race. Um, and it's a fascinating sport. Have you got to know any of the young American riders? You know, TJ Van Garderen or Taylor Taylor Finney? I mean, no. I, 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 I read about them. Mm. My son knows all about them. I'll slowly, hopefully, get back mm. into that. I make just to kind of get back in, and to uh, regain that passion that I once had for cycling. And do you have many communications with Brian Cookson, the new UCI president? I haven't since last September. But I had quite a few talks with him in last summer, and I've watched what he's doing. I love what he's doing. If you think about it, it's really dramatic relative to... I never thought it would flip that quickly. Mm. I actually thought the sport's going to not survive. If McQuaid and the old guard would have stayed there, it would have been more of the same. And I like him coming from a, from an approach that he wants to not only just kind of address the doping issue, but try to look at how to innovate and bring more excitement or entertainment. I don't even want to call it entertainment, more insight to what the sport's mm-hmm. about. I was very impressed meeting him, and I like that he's actually um, 
can tell he loves cycling, mm-hmm. and that's what he cares about. That's what the sport needs. Because mm-hmm. at one point, people get kind of the power of the money starts turning on. That's why I would say I'm. I mean, I'm coming back is because I actually do believe there's real change happening. Yeah, you, you're not someone to blow your own trumpet, but you must watch that film with a certain amount of pride. Do you, do you like the fact, enjoy the fact that an awful lot of people who aren't maybe that familiar with your story are gonna are gonna see that? Oh yeah, that? I think your book. Uh, I think your book. Uh, people read it. I think it's it's really. Um, uh, time what cycling's about, but also the personality. But also, it's kind of nice that there's a book that's. Uh, I said I don't think I will. I don't know if I'll ever write a book. No, you're, <laughs> like, you're supposed to write a book. I think aren't you? Yeah, I am supposed to. I, I probably would torture myself through a book. There's actually so many little things I, I would be. I'd get too detailed. So I, I even like the movie. I go. I would go way into detail. So you like the fact it's about one. It's focusing on one race. Yeah. yeah. Actually, my, I said my friend who watched it at our house. Mm. Uh, he said, oh, God, you, you could do one on 89. I mean, really, when you think of the rate, that's what's beautiful about all these races. It's They're their own soap opera. Their own, own genre, sopra, yeah. soap opera. And 89 was kind of like 80, 86. But 89, 89 to me was the, there's the, I haven't seen what's going on the inside of Sky, but um, mm. I got to imagine there was a lot of tension between Froome and Wiggins. And, and, and I think it's, it's, I think what you said about everybody's ambition is absolutely dead on. That's why I go, you know, it's, I, I'd love to. I was hoping last year it'd be split the team of Sky, mano mano. I think Wiggins should have left the team, gone for his own, own position. But everybody's psychologically different, and sometimes I think winning the tour is a huge pressure. Mm. And it that puts, 89 tour had the, the suspense without the. The bitterness, the rancor. It was a pure sporting battle. Eighty nine, wasn't oh God, it? You it was Fino. nice. I said, and I said it was pure joy. Yeah. And I didn't have much. I finished with two riders, uh, yeah. but it was like such a joy not to be struggling and not. It was everything was positive. I said, 80, 1990 was like I'd never raced the Tour de France without with a full team. With a full team. Yeah. Although I did in eighty four, but I was not at my best. But we we had we went ten stages and mm. first and third. So. I don't know if I miss racing so much. I miss the. Uh, I see the film. I go, oh god, that it makes was you good. nostalgic. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm nostalgic lately. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was magical. I think uh, you know, seeing my dad and my wife in the movie, and it's just like it was. It was pretty magical. It was actually a huge, huge dedication, huge commitment to, to make. It seems like uh, it's more accepted. I don't know. For seeing it seemed like it's such a big deal going to Europe, and then going there with no language and kind of unknown territory. Uh, but it was fun. The Cycling Podcast: Interviews and Analysis. We've got the big talking points covered. So we heard earlier on from Dan Martin, uh, who was second at Flesh Alone. First time we've really, first we've really seen of him this this season. Uh, obviously, the start of his year. Um, Daniel, what did you make of Dan Martin's performance there? Very impressed, Rich. I mean, he's obviously he's a rider who knows how to deal with the murderhoy. The even riders who on paper, you know, kind of punchers who should thrive on that climb, and um, they tend to fall into category into two categories: riders who can and, and just can't figure out how to ride it. And, and he certainly can. I mean, he's finished he finished fourth two years ago, second this time. Um, then the logical next step would be to win that race. But I suspected that he might be a bit undercooked coming into the Ardennes and the Limburg Classic because he hadn't, he hadn't raced an awful lot. And um, I spoke to him a few weeks ago, three or four weeks ago. He was, at, he was doing some altitude training in the Sierra Nevada for the first time that he tried altitude training. And as we've seen in the past, altitude training can suit certain riders and other riders just can't get to grips with it and it can have quite negative, certainly immediate effects, you know, in the three or four weeks afterwards. But um, it seems to have worked well for, for Danny. He seems to be on good form. Um, he pulled out of um, Amstel on um, the previous weekend, and there'd been, I think, well, there, there was a bit of a discussion between his father and Jonathan Waters on Twitter about um, you know, whether he should have pulled out, whether he should have carried on to help the team. Hopefully that's all patched up now before Liège on Sunday. But, you know, it's a big year for him because he obviously has to confirm 
Um, what he did last year was an absolutely fantastic year, winning Catalonia and the stage in the Tour and, and Liège. Um, and he has had a reputation as being quite a delicate rider and someone who you know suffered frequent injury sex setbacks, illnesses, but he's really got to grips with this allergy problem that he used to have that used to um, cause him problems in the spring. And um, yeah, he's really sort of laid down a marker now as one of the, the top riders in this kind of race. Interesting, you mentioned the Twitter spec because Jonathan Vorters, the Garmin Sharp boss, um, put a tweet out shortly after Martin had finished second saying that he had sent Dan an email saying it's time for him to step up and be a leader of this team and then Dan's father, Neil Martin, who's an ex-British professional himself, said something along the lines of perhaps you should um, provide him with a team to be leader of and then it sort of, you know, it it wasn't... It didn't strike me as page one on the team management um, manual uh, for Jonathan Vorters to kind of put that out on Twitter. You know, maybe in a you know in an interview, perhaps a little bit after, um, you know, in a, in a kind of review of the uh, team's performance at the Arden Classics, that's the kind of thing that might come out. But you can't really imagine. Sorry for the football reference, but you can't really imagine Dave a football Brailsford. manager <laughs> uh, or, or Dave Browsford, yeah, uh, just who steering your football there. Well, he he is on Twitter, but never posts anything. He's just a Don't sort of lurk lurker. Um, yeah, you can't imagine, uh, you know, it's not exactly um, conventional management technique, is it, to sort of say that after. It's almost like a sort of a, a, a grab at some credit um, for the result. And really, you know, from having seen Dan Martin in the morning, you know, he clearly was up for the race because, as uh, as you probably heard in the pre-race interview, he was quite curt, quite monosyllabic and, and just had his game face on. Yeah, and, and I think that will have stung Dan slightly, the, the insinuation that um, he wasn't leading the team well because from speaking to him a few weeks ago, like I said, he this is something that he's very conscious of this year because there's a real changing of the guard at Garmin Sharp. Um, Zabrisk is gone, Van der Velde's gone, and I think it's the message has been put across to guys like Dan that they really need to take responsibility and, and you know step up as leaders. And I think it's been something that he has tried very hard at this year and feels that he's doing quite well at. So to then have his manager turn around and suggest that's perhaps not been the case, I think probably um, bothered him slightly. Especially, no. as he's, especially as he's won the Liège Baston Liège and, and that fantastic stage in the Pyrenees in the Tour when he, he, you know, he was the absolute embodiment of a team leader. He executed that plan perfectly. Daniel, yeah, moving on from Dan Martin, um, you had a conversation I think, with Mark Cavendish last night. You got a little bit of news from Filippo Pizzato as well. Briefly, I um, saw Mark Cavendish last night at the launch of his new clothing line for Specialised. I can't... The, 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 the Cavendish... The, <laughs> the Cavendish clothing is still, line. Is it still... Is it still... Nothing. Um, <laughs> no. seen, have, they, have they been the... <laughs> seems so. It seems so. But he was in very good spirits. Um... Perhaps surprisingly good spirit. Some people assume that because he hasn't won as much as he would have liked this year, um, you know, he's, he's he might be down slightly demoralised. Not at all. Feels really good. And um, he's certainly happier with the team this year. He feels that certain complaints he had about them, the way the team has been managed last year, that they have been addressed. And he's certainly very happy. No question of him leaving at the end of this year. Some people have suggested that he might leave before the end of his contract. He's got a three-year contract, but he says, oh, he's absolutely. Um, satisfied where he is and he'll be there next year and Pozzato what's this about Filippo well, uh, podcast favourite Filippo Pozzato different story there so Pozzato was down to ride the Giro for Lampre Merida he has now been taken out of the team the relationship between Pozzato and the team it has deteriorated somewhat I'm led to believe in the last two or three weeks he obviously didn't have a very good classics campaign um, at the start of the season he asked for freedom to basically train the way he wanted to train um, Lamprey are coached by Michele Bartoli the old classics maestro um, that's how he used to catalogue himself I think um, but Pozzato was, was given latitude to kind of do his own thing and they said okay but you know we want to see the results and um, the results have not been good at all there have been a lot of Instagram posts a lot of Twitter posts a lot of coffee stops um, is, judging is, by he, those photos he mentioned earlier he's on a lot of money isn't he at Lampre? yeah he, I think it would surprise people how much he is on he's still on well over half a million euros a year um, I think and he's got a three year contract and he's only a year and a half into that three year contract but the way things are going at the moment it, it would be perhaps be a surprise if he saw out the and last and year and a half of that contract. You were mentioning, I mean, rela- relation, communication has broken down as well. Has there not been problems between them even getting hold of him? Well, yeah, the team 
uh, apparently found it difficult to track him down at, at times, or he's been. Re- I think he's probably got about six mobile phones: one in, registered in Monte Carlo, one in France, um, one in Italy. And yeah, they, they've struggled to tie him down at times. Um, and I don't, yeah, I don't think he's very happy. And I think there's got to be question marks really over the future. I mean, there have been question marks over the future of his career for a long time. But if you look at the last three experiences. He's, He's had it ended badly with Katuja. He had a big argument with Andre Chmil, mainly over bikes on that occasion. Um, then it ended badly with Luca Shinto at um, the the team that now calls itself Yellow, Yellow Fluo, and it's not going in the right direction at Lamprey. So, and you know, just sort of knowing him and, and knowing how he feels about the criticism that is often sent his way from the press and. Um, team management as well I, I wouldn't be too shocked if if this went south he, he might decide that he's had enough and you know I think he's 32 this year he might decide that um, it's time to bid farewell Is it true that Lamprey have called up a wig glued to a broom handle as Pozzato's <laughs> replacement for the Giro? Lionel that's very unkind uh, well, Chira, our old friend Chira will be monitoring this situation I'm sure for us he's, 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 Chira, he's, on, speed, he's on speed dial whatever phone Pozzato is using yeah well Chira of course like Pozzato is going to miss the Giro this year is he missing the yeah, Giro Why because he's on the Nibali programme he has to go he has oh. to follow Vincenzo Nibali wherever he goes Vincenzo I think I said in the last podcast did I well, Chira knows more about Vincenzo Nibali than Vincenzo Nibali knows well, about this is great. I mean it's great news for, the, for our Tour de France podcast because we're going to have Chiro on on a regular basis I think hopefully I mean if Nibali still abandons nego- still negotiating if Nibali abandons on stage in Yorkshire Chira might get, be on the first plane home oh god that'd be a disaster Naples. for the podcast he'd be on the beach by stage three <laughs> So, uh, any any other business chaps, or are we going to wrap it up? We've tried to cram a lot into this week's podcast. Anything else? And um, what about the very quickly the tour presentation? I was um, trying to avoid the, the the tour presentation tickets furor. Sorry, Rich. Um, I didn't realize uh, you had your how own do you agenda. Feel, how do you feel? <laughs> of all, I always bring my own agenda. <laughs> we're moving part four. We're going to move on to Jamaican sprinting, but the the tour presentation in uh, Yorkshire is going to cost money, quite a lot of money. Um, I. I've felt shortchanged at previous tour presentations having not paid for it. <laughs> so uh, I can't imagine what they're planning to put on. It'll have to be uh, some show. It'll which which famous acts come from Yorkshire that they can wheel out for this? Alan Bennett. <laughs> the Arctic Monkeys. Yeah. Alan Bennett. <laughs> yeah, I can see that going down well. Yeah, for, uh, that, <laughs> for that amount of money, I'd expect nothing less than Atomic Kitten. But they're not f- even from Yorkshire, are they? It's 45 to £85 pounds plus booking fee um, for a ticket at the, um, the Leeds Arena. Um, Leeds First Direct Arena, I think it's called. Um, it can hold um, a maximum capacity 13,000 people. There was a foray on Twitter, particularly um, when the ticket prices were announced. And the Latour Yorkshire people um, moved quickly to clarify that the, um, it's a not-for-profit event so it's not like they're lining the coffers or even covering the funding shortfall the BBC reported which is uh, there's a 2.3 million pound funding gap on the tours visit to um, Britain which is being currently being picked up by UK Sport to cover the gap Um, but no the money from the team presentation ticket sales will go into putting on the event Um, and on just doing some very back of a bag packet calculations you know there could be upwards of a million pounds revenue from that event so a million pound show I'm I'm like you Richard I'm struggling to think what they can possibly do I hope Danny Boyle's involved on a serious note the the people the punters will be going there to see the riders The, the 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 sad thing is that for the riders it's a chore that they could really do without. Any rider who's there to, to try and win the tour especially uh, is trying to get through that with a minimum of fuss and hassle. And, you know, if you want to see bored-looking riders trudging onto a stage and standing there waving, it's just, I mean, it's the, the tour itself is free and that's the main thing. I, I think, you know, if you've got a choice between going to the tour presentation or going to the start and getting good access to the start area, or even standing by the side of the road to watch the race pass, I would certainly recommend the latter. 
I'm, I'm assuming that you know Yorkshire, Danny Boyle was bound to be involved in some way. The teams will come onto stage. Um, there'll be a, a majestic set of a hillside. Yorkshire hillside will be built inside the Leeds Direct Arena, and each team will come sliding down the hill in nine-man baths, a la Last of the Summer Mo- Last of the Summer Wine, I think something really, like that. You, I think you've that's. Been, you've been giving this quite a lot of thought, haven't you? Are you offering these ideas up for free, or do you want a slice of that million pounds? <laughs> yeah, a ten percent would do. 10% would be very nice indeed. <laughs> anyway, any, anything else to add to ticket prices? Oh, frenzy? On that low note, I yeah. think we should probably end. No Lionel <laughs> Richie. No Lionel Richie. Yeah, we've had it already. Oh, yeah, sorry. It was very subtle no heated this debate. Week. This, we should have had the heated debate. Now, what about happened to Mystery Voice as well? I was thinking about that while you were away in Jamaica. Oh, we've on the lo- that those long. Those we, we ran out of um, funding for posting out prizes. <laughs> <laughs> we're hoping to get some more. Uh, anyway, that's all for this week. Uh, we'll be back again next week uh, on our weekly podcast. Apologies for the little delay this week. It was al- to allow me to get over my jet lag, which I've almost done. Well, it was mostly because of the Easter holiday. Oh, that as well um, so thank you very much Lionel thank you Richard thanks Daniel thank, thanks. thanks both of you for holding the fort while I was away oh, thanks Rich no worries it's good to have you back I'm contractually obliged to say that this is the cycling podcast with Richard Moore Lionel Burney and Daniel Freed. <laughs>